and then eventually uh, open it up for businesses uh, to use along with building custom applications. Website. And the website is Arkham, A-R-K-H-A-M dot I-O. Twitter account. And Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is at Arkham Storage. It's capital Arkham, capital storage. My gun is broken. My gun is broken. From Huntsville, Alabama, you are listening to My Code is Broken, a podcast by developers for everybody. Here is your host, Dan Nagel. My gun is broken. My gun is broken. Greetings, beautiful nerds. Welcome to My Code is Broken, Episode 6, reaching the first live recording. In this episode, we have a chat with WizKid Noah Uberfeely. He taught himself computer programming without owning a computer. Then after finally receiving one, less than a year later, he started a web business. This is before he is even old enough to vote. This interview is coming up shortly. The second interview was recorded live during co-working night, an event that is actually led by Noah. The founders of Black Label Data came by, and we discussed their new secure storage service called Arkham. I thought the live recording went quite well, and believe it may become a regular feature. Going live requires a podcast format change. Noah's interview is being presented using my normal documentary style, with music interludes, commentary, and so on. Documentary editing does not work well live, Therefore, the Arkham interview is presented mostly as is, with just very light editing. So, think of this as two podcast episodes in one. I hope you enjoy the show. First up, Noah. Well, go ahead and state your name. My name is Noah Huber Feely. And what is your occupation? I'm a web developer. You're a web developer. And what is interesting about your web development is how you started web development. Yeah. And can you tell that story? Definitely. So um, I'm currently in high school and it was about a year and a half ago that I first um, ever wrote any lines of code. Um, And so I was interested in learning a little bit about programming because I thought it might have um, some use in just to put on the resume or or something like that um, in future jobs or or other applications. Mm -hmm. But as I began to work more and more with it, um, I became absolutely excited by what I could do because this was the first time I could really do whatever I wanted because computer programming is like having a superpower. Um, and before um, I began computer programming, I was dead set on being a fantasy fiction writer. So this was far removed from what I'd been doing, but I absolutely loved it and have gone on to learn nine programming languages and I'm learning my 10th now. Just out of curiosity, did you ever write any? fantasy fiction? I did, yeah. I how, didn't how publish along? anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I wrote at least, um, s- s- I wrote several hundred pages and wrote a full story, which I didn't try to publish, but yeah, I, I wrote many hundreds of <laughs> pages. Do you, do you still have that manuscript? I do, yeah. <laughs> so if you become famous, this could be the the bemusings of Noah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good before point. Before he made his big break. Yeah. (laughs) Now, you skipped over a huge chunk of um, your progression in the program in that for X number of years, you didn't even have electricity nor a laptop. So you were starting pretty much ground zero with basically no knowledge, way I believe it, no knowledge of the computer at all. Yeah, so I live on a farm, and for the first eight years of my life, we had no electricity at all um, and currently only have solar-powered batteries, so that doesn't provide enough electricity to have it on continuously. And because we live in a rural area, um, there's no internet service provider that is fast, So, and they all have data caps, so it definitely makes it rough. However, um, one can definitely manage and do a lot of stuff locally and everything. But yeah, it's far removed from the agrarian lifestyle I was living before. So when, what age did you get your first computer? Yeah, so I got my first computer about a year ago, so I would have been 16. Okay. So you got your computer. <clears throat> well, first you studied books, and you said, okay, I'm done with books. Time to get a computer. You got your computer, and now you're studying programming then. 
and then you started a web venture. Yeah. And how long was that when you was studying programming and you said, okay, I think I'm skilled enough to start picking up freelance gigs. When did you determine that you could go that route? What actually happened was I was at this outfitting store um, that sells things for mountain climbers or hike or people who hike and mountain bike and other such things. And I was purchasing a pair of Chacos and the, I, I was just talking with the lady there that was fitting them, and she happened uh, to mention that there was this um, opening cause, uh, at the store for uh, an intern to do web admin, uh, to, to uh, yeah, basically take care of their online store. And so I talked with the people there, and they were really interested in hiring me on. Uh, and so I started out with this paid internship and then quickly realized that I could make far more money freelancing. Uh, and so then I went on and began talking to organizations that needed a website upgrade and, and then went from there and was, pretty, uh, was able to pretty quickly get clientele. So yeah, it, it definitely didn't require um, much time before I was able to really begin programming using WordPress initially, initially uh, because that's pretty straightforward. But then uh, recently I've been doing stuff that is much more advanced than I would have ever dreamed of doing for clientele beforehand. Now, how did you convince your first client to sign on? Because one, you're so young, and two, you didn't really have a portfolio to point to because you didn't own a computer till you know, X months ago. Exactly. So that was definitely the hardest sell that I've had. Uh, but what I did is before the meeting, I had constructed a pretty simple prototype of the website I would design for them. And so then I show up to the meeting to discuss creating a website for them. And I show them this um, good looking, by my standards at that point, um, website built on WordPress and showed all the functionality and it was everything that they wanted. And so they saw that I could obviously do this because I already had. And then the rest of the work was just a little bit of editing. So that was able to get my foot in the door. And then they um, were, were glad to hire me on for freelancing. Yeah. Okay. So for you, the sale was different in that you front loaded your offer pretty considerable. So it's Sarah Blade saying, so the, the pitch was basically, I've just about already done it. You just need to hire me to take it these next five or six steps. Exactly. And then the client after that, I did something pretty similar. I didn't do as much work. And then after that, I had two clients that I had built websites for, and the rest came relatively easily. I'd like to back up just a little bit Great. to your learning to program. Do you think that you touching the computer and deciding to program with it with I mean, practically a blank slate mentality, touching it versus somebody who has been playing with computers for whatever reason, you know, writing documents in Word for reports or what have you, and then getting into college to learn how to programming. Do you think that that back-end knowledge would be a hindrance, whereas your blank slate approach would have been an advantage? Or do you see anything there? I do think that um, there could definitely be some benefit to not having an experience from early childhood where you never understood the internals of how computers worked and how programs worked. And because I, the first time I really truly uh, interacted with technology in any mean, meaningful way, I had already begun to understand how its underlying components worked. That meant that whenever I interacted with the computer, I sort of understood what was going on. And since then, I've, of course, gone on to learn a lot more. But I think that I, definitely having an understanding of how it worked before I touched it um, definitely can have benefits. But I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I wonder if it's similar to, say, getting a development board, you know, like, like, like the Raspberry Pi, so to speak, whereas... The type of person who would get that Raspberry Pi, they've probably already done a lot of research about how it works, how it does this, how it does this. So they would get it and it's, they would approach it from a very academic standpoint of study where they would start hitting the pro points, connecting things. It's like, okay, that makes sense. So that may have been the way you attack the computer. Exactly. So you already had studied it with your 
reading the book from the library. So when you got it, now you're just approaching it, you know, say as a scientist would approach this device saying, okay, if I hit this probe point, it should echo out this. And to you, it's not like uh, growing up with a toy that you decide to start trying to program. Yeah, it never seemed like it worked by magic. I, I understood exactly how it worked and, and all, all the things that went into making the graphics appear and, and all the other components. Coworking Night is an event that started off as a way for developers to collaborate and has since grown to accommodate any creative venture. Whether you want to learn something new, co-work, or get stuff done, every Wednesday evening, the AL.com news office downtown donates their building from 6 to 11 p.m. For the past few months, Noah has been leading the group. This episode of My Code is Broken was actually recorded during co-working night. Um, how did you find out about co-working night? Yeah, so I was looking on meetup.com for different programming events because in the local area, I didn't know any other programmers and I was really interested in becoming a part of that community. And so I was looking for meetups within 100 miles of me and this one popped up on the map. And so I decided, hey, um, it's like an hour and 20 minutes away, so I might as well drive down and check it out. So I, I went here and met Chris Beeman uh, and all these other people and was just, I loved the environment. I loved all the, that all the people there shared similar interests as me. And so that's, uh, that's basically how I first got introduced to it and has since then on to, since gone on to uh, be much more involved with the community itself. So right now, you've been designated as the leader of Coworking Night. Correct. So you drive an hour and a half to help organize co-working night, and you, you don't even live here. Yeah, and I've uh, and you're 17 spent, years yeah, old. I've spent 3.5 straight days of driving, <laughs> making it here and back. Yeah. To organize an event of your peers, many who are twice your age. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely quite comical, uh, but. I, I don't mind it, and, and I, the people here are all incredible, so it's definitely worth the drive. Hop Around Huntsville is an app that tracks the free Charlie in downtown Huntsville. It was developed by Noah Uberfeely and Larry Mason. Lots of places have transit tracking. It is not a particularly complicated problem to solve. What makes this app remarkable is one, I didn't even know Huntsville had a trolley, and two, Noah doesn't even live in Huntsville, and thus has little use for it. Why did you help develop an app for a town that's an hour and a half away for you? Yeah, so I wanted to become like a larger part of the community, and I also wanted to just take on a cool project because most of my work that I was bring in wasn't really advanced. It, it was just like throwing together portfolio websites and um, expository sites for organizations. And so it didn't require a lot of thought, but this would enable me to actually interact with like the physical world with the trolley and then um, mapping it out. And all of that was just exciting and something I hadn't done before. And so um, I instantly said yes. And then it definitely didn't require that much time. It was just about a, a week of like on off development, so just like several hours to actually get it up and, and running. Right. So the app is called Hop Around Huntsville. It's at hoparoundhuntsville.com. Now, n not to discredit your work, but when I was looking at it and I was talking to you and Larry, it seemed to me that the achievement here is not so much. The technical aspect, it was getting through all the legal hurdles with the city of Huntsville for exactly. you to be able to install this app and let this app run. So th this comes a, a development problem of, you know, legal drive in the bus and not so much technical decisions. Yeah, so for a project that took a week to develop, it took two and a half months to get through the legal department. And so... Um, that was definitely uh, a really significant amount of the time, just talking with them and making sure that it was exactly what they wanted. Um, and it's understandable that they have to go through all these checks to make sure that it's something that the city um, is happy to, to show off. 
but yeah, it can definitely be frustrating at times. Um, and, and you're very right that it's not that sophisticated. Uh, it's, and other cities have this. It's just that Huntsville hadn't upgraded um, their transportation system for that. And so this was a ripe opportunity to move the Rocket City forward. Now, the code for Huntsville, the launch party for Hop Around Huntsville, I thought this was just absolutely fascinating. So so the, the app was launched, and you spent the entire time on the bus because the launch party was at a bar, and you weren't old enough to go to the bar. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so although I could walk in, it definitely wasn't, it, it was a bar, and it wasn't the kind of environment. So yeah, I just rode around on the trolley and helped people out if they needed directions or wanted to use the app. So yeah, it, it was definitely comical, though. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I, I didn't mind it at all. Were you thinking of diving into mobile programming languages like Android, Java, and Swift and all that? Yeah, so I've had to work with mobile some, and I'm definitely interested in going um, further into that. And unfortunately, iOS is sort of a closed box where you have to be in the Mac ecosystem uh, but, yeah, that's definitely something that, that I will be um, developing for and on. And there's open source things like Cordova that, that I can use to write something on Windows and then ship it to you, all sorts of platforms. You would not be pleased with the performance of Cordova. Yeah. Just so, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Since you already know Ruby, you may want to consider Ruby Motion, looking into that instead. That yeah. It's a... It's a lot lighter weight and it has kind of a hybrid HTML native widgets going on. So you might have more success with that. I'll definitely have to check that out because, yeah, um, Cordova definitely has its drawbacks. And um, it's, is, it is really useful to be able to develop for all sorts of platforms. Okay. Have you dove into any like major toolkits? I'm thinking game development such as... Unity with its Unity script or Unreal Engine or Lua for uh, Corona-based apps? Have you looked into game dev type stuff? Yeah, so I definitely have and have worked a little bit with Unity, um, but game development is definitely not my area of interest, and gaming is, is not yeah something that I'm, I'm really interested in, so that has never been on the top of my uh, priority list. However, it can be useful to know how to do that because um, when it comes to like, creating simulations or other such things, knowing how to create a game is, is of course, um, uh, has many principles that are shared. Well, the tool set, such as Unity, that's the, the one that I yeah. really like, is that, I mean, it can, you can learn a platform and from that you can target desktop and mobile and all that sorts of things so you could focus your effort into into that so you don't have to make a game with it i mean you can make it a standard tool with it and just leverage the the game dev compiler to hit or hit everything that you're looking for yeah that is so true and sometimes things can have gamification and without actually being thought of as a game and, and that's, of course, a whole other matter. But yeah, you, you are so right about how it can be really useful to know these tools so that you can save lots of time. And that's one reason why I use them, because I can just type, like I, I can hit eight keys and do what it would have taken me hundreds of mouse clicks otherwise. So definitely um, cutting down the workflow to save as much time as possible so I can truly just code um, as, as much as I want, but not have to re- uh, like recode things for different platforms that I've already written. So you are the CTO of, how do you say the name? Um, a yeah, proxy? A proxy, as well as the co-founder. As well as the co-founder. So this is on top of you doing service with Code for Huntsville, running co-working night, and of course, doing self, sc- yeah. self-study schooling, living an hour and a half away and getting ready for college. Yep, as well as um, being a part of many other organizations such as the Teen Action Group locally and um, and all sorts of other things. So yeah, so, it's a lot of projects. <laughs> so where do you charge your dilithium crystals? Um, yeah, so 
I, I, I love coding. And so, yeah, I will just, um, I could code all day. And, and so luckily many of the projects that I'm a part of and clients, the coding that I'm doing is, is actually enjoyable and fun. So that's, that's how I, um, how I go each day. Yeah. Right. How far along is a proxy? Yeah, so a proxy um, has a fully working mobile app, and all it takes is deploying it to the app store as well as the administrative panel um, for client or for the hospitals and the doctors um, who also have their own apps and and web based platforms, so so that they can easily um, accept clients and then manage the timing and payments. Did you develop this mobile app? No, so I actually joined a proxy after they were well into the development process. And so interestingly enough, the development um, is being done in India. And I've definitely been able to help out some, but uh, it was basically done when I came on board. Even though with future updates, I'll definitely be a large part of that. Um, Is there things about the technical details that you could tell us about how the system works? Yeah. So... It's um, a rather like, straightforward, tried and true system. So there's nothing novel about it. Um, however, it is it does allow rapid like telecommunication, and in the long run, we want people to um, ha- not have to go to the doctor's office for many situations where they could just talk with the doctor and go through um, the diagnosis and then get a medication prescribed, so that from their home they can easily take care of all of that. And so that would be done through the mobile app. And so, yeah, it's just a standard app which connects up to this um, middleware in the cloud, and then that distributes calls to the um, to both the database and the clients and doctors. Now, there's been Teladoc services going on forever, and so what what makes yours unique? Is it the, the app that helps you on the first three or four stages, and then it says, "Okay, contacting a doctor." Is that kind of what so it the um, the part about uh, telecommunication with with the doctor isn't really um, a selling point of the app. It's rather the ability to remove the need for a wait line um, and or to, so basically people can get to the doctor faster and know when they need to show up. And so that's the largest selling point um, that that we're pushing the app. So with. this is sounds kind of like. Uh... Fast pass for doctors, you know, where, you know, Disney World, they have this fast pass where you get a ticket ahead of time and you go do something else and you come back at your assigned time now and waste less time. So this kind of like similar type system for doctors. Exactly. So, yeah, it's um, it's definitely disrupting um, the healthcare market locally and um, soon beyond in a very, very similar way. You can find Noah at noahcodes.com and on Twitter at nuberfeely. Next is the live show featuring Arkham Storage. We talk business, code, and security. Here is Arkham Storage. My code is broken! Go ahead and state your name. Okay, so I'm Amy Pettigrew. I'm the CEO of Black Label Data. And my name is Max Franks, and I I am the CTO of Black Label Data. The product line that we're talking about today is Arkham Storage. Arkham? Arkham. And it's spelled? A-R-K-H-A-M. Okay. What I would like to know is, how did you come up with that name? I I think of two things. I think of Batman, and I think of, what was the author, Love? Love H.P. Lovecraft. Yes. That's yeah. the one. Now, did you decide on patterning it off of HP Lovecraft because of you might get copyright problems with Batman? <laughs> I looked. I actually looked up the the copyright, and so it's interesting. The Arkham um, like name or reference comes from the very early um, Lovecraft um, content, which is not copyrighted. Uh, right. So I made sure, completely sure of that before. Um, I believe the book came out in late 1800s. Yeah. So yeah. you're you're good to go I, there. Yeah. Pretty good. Now, 
Archim.io. Did you choose yeah. .io because that has a developer focus extension? Generally, yeah. Yeah, it's more techie. Yeah. Did, did you play with .com domain names? And we spent a well, going back to when we, um, so we recently changed the name of the company to Black Label Data a few months ago. And we, like, it took like weeks to come up with a good, good name that had an available domain name to go with it. Um, luckily, we did not spend or have to spend as much time um, coming up with a name and a domain for Arkham. So, you were named Arkham, and then you changed your name to Black Label Data, and now your product is called Arkham Storage? So, it's a little different than that. So, our group has been around since uh, like 2012. Well, so we were mostly in the contracting side. We did We've done some work for Hudson Alpha and um, mostly small time contracting gigs. And then we re and our company company name was called um, Analytical and Collaborative Solutions. It's the is. acronym is ACOS, A C O S, mm -hmm. but it's quite a mouthful. So we changed it and uh, to Black Label Data is the company name. And then the product line is Arkham or Arkham Storage. Yeah, okay. so we started out as sort of a consulting business, and then we were trying to pivot into more of a product-based okay. um, business rather than a service-based model. How many employees do you have? Is it just you two? We have four founders. Um, one is my husband, Michael Pettigrew, and then we have Max and myself and um, Jarvis Martin. Okay. Now, Max, you have a software development background? Uh. I did not go to school for software, actually. Um, my degree is in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Um, however, like, and that's, I've been out of college like eight or eight or nine years now. But uh, when I, right out of college, I joined a team that was doing just software. And so I don't have a, quote, classical or, I don't know, background in computer science or programming. But I've kind of spent those eight or nine years learning how to do it. Um, I, I think after eight or nine years of development experience, you, you can call yourself a software developer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> having, having a formal certificate from a university is not required. Sure. Right. And you have a bio. Right. right. So I have a bachelor's in biology and chemistry, and then I spent some time in grad school for biotechnology, and then I did sort of the hard pivot into the whole software CEO thing. Okay, so you said biochemistry? Mm hmm How does biochemistry translate to security software? Um, well, it doesn't really. <laughs> but if, if grad school teaches you anything, it's how to learn. And so you don't really need a specific background in anything if you know how to learn about it. So... But but I think kind of what I bring to the table is a lot of our customers are more in the, I don't want to say layman type group, but our customers aren't all security professionals because we're trying to make a product for the consumer. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of bring the consumer side, but I also um, have just kind of learned business from, I was um, the business person for our consulting group you know, since 2012. So I've been learning the business trade since then. So as CEO, would you say you fall mostly with business decisions and yeah. and the business strategy of your Arkham product? Yeah, I would say so. And especially with um, our B2B or business to business model, um, I excel in like going out and finding partners and then making partnerships happen and that kind of thing. So you don't really need the exact perfect technical background to do that, but you do need to have enough of a background where you understand what you're talking about because you have to know your product inside and out, whether you were formally trained in that field or not, you still have to know your product. Right. So I went to your website, Arkham.io, mm -hmm. to research your product, Okay. and I believe Arkham.io is fairly vague, mm -hmm. so 
that's okay. I would, I would like to deep dive into the technical here. details. Sure. But for everybody out there, I could make the pitch for Arkham.io, but I was wondering if you could just give us the, the five minute elevator pitch sure. for what your product is. Um, Amy, do you want to do this or do you want me to do it? Um, I can do it, yeah. Okay. Um, so Arkham is a file storage service, so it's cloud file storage and it's end-to-end -end encrypted and it's also um, anonymized and zero. we have zero knowledge of your data. So it's, you could say, sort of an encrypted Dropbox. Right, encrypted Dropbox, encrypted Google Drive. Now, Dropbox is free. You have a free service. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between Arkham IO, the, the value add that you provide that I wouldn't be able to find at Dropbox? Well, Dropbox is not encrypted. If you want your stuff encrypted in Dropbox, you have to encrypt it first and then put it in Dropbox. And our service, it gets, in drop, it gets encrypted as you drop it in. So you can drag, drop, encrypt. Yeah, so especially in the consumer market, there is a, there's a, a lot of competi competitors, namely Google, like Google Drive, you have Dropbox, and more recently you have uh, Microsoft now offering a, a cloud storage um, and Amazon Prime Storage is another. Right. So it, the consumer space is, is littered with competitors. Um, however, the, I think our value add is primarily in the, in the security and privacy. Um, if you're really concerned about that, then the, those big guys are not going to provide you with the level of security that you're going to have with our service. Uh, that's kind of the value add that we want to bring to the table, essentially. So, if I wanted to, and I wanted to replicate what your product does with Dropbox, is some potential thing I could do is drop to the command line, run encrypt on the file, get a binary blob, and throw that on Dropbox? Is that kind of the essentially what you're yeah. doing for me? Well, uh, except that we're not built on Dropbox, but... Um, but similar. this would be my own personal similar, yeah. Arkham storage with Dropbox as a back end. Right. Right, and so coming from a technical background myself, um, I guess we could we have the expertise to do that. But maybe the the average consumer that does not have a technical background does not have the know how of how to how to do that. So we would like to provide a an application that would allow them um, to use the same security and privacy that we could um, build for ourselves. That they don't ne necessarily have the skills or knowledge to to build themselves. I mean, the fact is that when convenience and privacy go head-to-head, -head, convenience usually wins. So if you want a privacy and security platform, it has to be as easy to use as possible if you're really going to attract people to it, because right. there is a barrier to entry. I thought about the way your client would work, and it's like you said, you can be secure, you can be convenient. It's very hard to have both. Yeah. And what am I losing when I go to Arkham? And these are some of the things that I thought of that I'm losing. Like one would be um, online file sharing. So if I take the file, I put it in Arkham, you have no idea what it is, so you can't share it with anybody. That's not... I'll let Max take Sure. That. Um, yeah, so kind of what... The way that we're going is we have um, encrypted file storage, but we'd also like, um, if I wanted to send you something, then I could encrypt it with your uh, public key and then send it to you. So that, again, this file is stored um, in the cloud, but then you and only you have access to it So from your client. You're not sharing the file, you're sharing the key for me to decrypt the file. Right. And it is the, the, de the decryption key. Yeah, so... Don't you normally share the encryption key when you do a public-private pairing? Right. So this, for this BA, would you be doing a one-off encryption of the file and sharing that unique key so only that could decrypt the file? Is that how it works? Uh, originally, yes. So um, we started the project. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, a personal and pet project that I started back in September. And then I brought it to the team and... Um, we decided that we actually wanted to pursue making it a product. 
And at that time, um, I was relying on um, the users uh, to be more technical where they could manage their public and private keys. Uh, and then we would store uh, the public key. And then uh, if we were contacts or friends, so to speak, in, in, the, in Arkham, um, then I could send you something using your public key. And then you could download it from your client on the private key with your private, with your private key. Um, and then we got to talking. Again, the, the average consumer is not going to know or have any experience dealing with encryption keys. I can guarantee you that at least 95% of the general public would be completely lost in our conversation right now. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, we, so we've partnered, or we're working on partnering with another company here in town, um, Energies uh, and Key Holdings, which have uh, some proprietary crypt, um, cryptography um, technology that we're going to use, and, or we're trying to use which would allow um, us to perform the same amount of security and privacy that we guaranteed before without having to make the user uh, manage their own public and private keys. Um, so it puts the key management completely under the hood. So you're still using a public-private key, but it's being um, regenerated every time you use it and then immediately destroyed, so the, the key is never stored anywhere. That is similar to how LastPass works. So then with LastPass, there is all this uh, key exchange and sharing, but it's all transparent to me. But all I care about is my LastPass password. Exactly. And then it downloads through crypto files, decrypts them, and displays them that way. So you would be piecing together a similar mechanism for Archon. Correct, yeah. It's long the, I don't know if it would be exactly the same. It's probably not exactly the same because we're using... Well, um, probably not, but, probably uh, not, but similar, similar type strategy. Right, which it takes the burden off of the user to manage their own um, public and private keys. So that could potentially solve uh, online file sharing. Instead of sharing the file, you share the key, and then you somehow in your... Arkham service, you would flag this file as saying this is available to someone who has the key. Right. And I assume that it gets downloaded and the client would decrypt it because you have no knowledge of what it is and you don't want to have knowledge of what it is. Exactly. All right. The other downside to encrypting a big fat binary blob to transfer, because that, that's all you see is a big fat binary blob, is that say I have a half gigabyte podcast audio file and then I put it in my Arkham storage mm -hmm. I make one little tweak at minute 25 sure. you know to filter out a, a bad word if your client encrypts the whole thing you have to resend the entire mm -hmm. 400 megabyte blob versus right. just sending the difference that's true that's a very good point and especially since it's a um, since it's encrypted the I mean, there is no pattern to the encrypted data, right? So finding a... Right, the hash is completely different now. It's completely different, yeah. So that is a, a disadvantage of having to send the whole file. So one, one little change yeah. that could have potentially been 20 kilobytes is now sure. another 400 megabyte upload of binary mm -hmm. data. I actually thought of a way you could solve this. Yeah. Really? Yes. Well, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it now. What you, what you could do is my 400 megabyte audio file, mm -hmm. drop chop it up into 10 right. megabyte chunks, mm -hmm. encrypt each 10 megabyte chunk mm -hmm. up those those piecemeal, right. and if I change this piece of the audio, you'll need to change this 10 megabyte chunk, sure. so that chops uh, one tenth the size of your upload. It does. It's, you can do that. That's pretty cool. And it's still yeah. just as secure. Yeah. Now, I would like to talk about your encryption scheme. Sure. Because you have that plastered all over your website where you are very proud of your 22,048-bit yeah. encryption. So, the so again, we're kind of in the middle of um, negotiating a, a license to use the other technology. So, um, which means that once we once we get that. Um, or able to use the, the technology that we just talked about, then we are going to move away from RSA um, and the 2048, right? Um, 
and move towards a towards AES 256, which gives you a, an increased level of security, but it also increases the, the performance, especially on smaller devices. How is AES 256, 256 bits, that that represents, yes. versus 2048 bits? How's that? It's a good question. So, um, from all of the research that I've done, a 256 bit AES key is comparable to a 15,360 bit RSA key. So, it, it's simply a better algorithm. Is that what you're using? Well, so there's pros and cons of, of using both. Um, so, RSA is asymmetric cryptography, which means that you have a public and private key. Um, AES is a symmetric crypt cryptographic algorithm, which means that... Same key, it's Same both. key, right. And so, the technology that we are um, going to use, or trying to use, um, would allow for use of the AES. Um, so, the way that it works is that the the key that is used for the encryption is generated um, when it's encrypted and then it's regenerated on the other side. So if I send you something, the key that's used to um, to encrypt the, the, or use with AES to encrypt the file, that key is destroyed as soon as I finish encrypting it. And then whenever you want to download it, then you can regenerate the key uh, until you're done uh, downloading it and then the key is gone again. Um, so which, again, it decreases the amount of time that the, the encryption key is even, um, I don't know, available. Now, is the key that's generated, are you taking a fingerprint of the computer? Or is it all password based? Are you talking to some that's server? Kind of where, that's where the, uh, the technology that we're using comes, in, comes into play. Because um, the way that it, it works is that I, I generate the key along with some, some metadata. The proprietary algorithm generates some metadata, which I send along with the encrypted data. Um, I assume and then, that's going over SSL. Yeah, right. And so um, then you can use the same metadata along with your uh, private key to decrypt the information. Well, I assume that uh, the, these are all standard best practices when it comes to encryption so we can feel right. secure. As far as the 1,024 bits versus 2048 bits, once you get to that threshold, it is essentially impossible to brute force. I don't know if any of you, we actually have an audience here for the recording, it's very exciting. I don't know <laughs> if y'all are familiar with encryption schemes, but essentially, once you get up to 1,024 bits, if every atom in the universe was a processor, brute force attacking that file, it would take longer than the universe has been in existence to brute force attack it. That is, once you get to 1,024 bits. And uh, Arkham is talking about 2,048 bits. So, I mean, I don't... Yeah. So, when, the, the way it's going to get cracked is not through brute force. It's right. either go, it's going to be a flaw in the algorithm itself, mm -hmm. or it's somebody taking a, a hammer to someone's head that knows the answer right. to get into it. So that's basically what you're looking at. Now, continuing on with the client. Yeah. Um, most security professionals, <laughs> they're fans of open source, and you have a lot of proprietary stuff going on in yeah. your client. Do you have any plans for open sourcing portions Something of it? Something that we have thought about and talked about, um, we have not made the decision to open source it yet. Um, but like you said, I think we, we can um, open source part of it. I have um, an idea. Yeah. Since you liked my other ideas yeah. so much, here's yeah. another idea. Yeah. <laughs> I thought of, say, I, I don't, I don't want to trust your client. I mean, you don't, Right. You don't want to know about my data. I don't want you to know about my encryption scheme. So I thought maybe there could be some method in the client where I could point you to the encryption algorithm I want you to use. And that way, you only have to care about the proprietary pieces of the metadata required for the syncing. And I'm probably right. perfectly fine keeping that proprietary. That way, from start to finish, it's a binary blob. I don't have to trust your client. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, 
It's a great idea. Um, we would have to we'd have to make sure that the whatever algorithms that we would offer the client to use um, that would be able to work with or are compatible with the the proprietary stuff that we're working with. It it may not be a very pretty series of command line switches. Yeah. But perhaps uh, you could develop some kind of plug-in system so some other professional could, you know, supply yeah. that, that I would trust. It has crossed my mind um, a few times to build a command line application that would perform the encryption um, and allow more technical-minded users to use that route instead of using the desktop application. What is the client written in? So the the client is, it's an Electron desktop application right now, Electron based. Um, that is Node.js? It is Node.js. Um, so it's very, it's kind of interesting. So um, Electron uses um, Google's Chrome engine behind the scenes to render web pages. Right, um, it is the same engine that the Atom editor uses. Exactly, yeah. Um, it's built on the same technology. Um, so. Our cloud servers are written in Go, and um, we have, uh, so the, the client is, is an Electron desktop application, but also uses um, some of, uh, part of it is using Go as well to, to communicate with, the, um, with our cloud servers. So I assume the encryption scheme is written in Go because it, JavaScript was running compression algorithms. That it's, sounds incredibly slow to me. <laughs> and insecure, yeah. So, the again, the proprietary um, encryption algorithms that we're using is C and C++. Um, and then we have Go bindings for that that we've written. Right, and your GUI on top of that is Electron. Yep. Okay. When can we see this? Soon. <laughs> is the... Yeah. Is the you, said, uh, you said here spring, know, spring of 2016, and, yes. and summer yes. is really pushing. Really <laughs> close, yeah. Yeah, um, so hopefully we'll be able to stick with that. Um, but we're, so we're still in the process of um, being able to license the technology that we're, we've been talking about. Um, so once that is signed and okayed and everything, then we can um, start transitioning away from the RSA that is on the website towards the new AES 256. Um, and that's going to take a, a little bit of time to transition um, that. But the short answer is three months or less, hopefully. That's what we're going yeah. for. Okay. Do you have plans for a mobile app? Eventually, mm -hmm. yes. And it tablet, yep. Yeah. Is my phone going to be responsible for RSA AES two fifty six decrypting, you know, uh, a four hundred megabyte file that I download? That would take up a lot of space on a phone. I yeah. have four hundred megs yeah. of space. I don't know if I have the the time for that decryption algorithm. Right. It would take a while to download that that as well. Yeah. But maybe I want to do that. Maybe so. Yeah. So, is it in the works? Not right now, not right now. So we wanted to uh, kind of start out with the desktop application to get um, get some users and hopefully get some traction. And then once we have some traction, then we move towards um, a mobile and tablet apps. Right, so I would like to uh, pause on technical side and maybe have a little philo philosophical discussion yeah, about- Yeah, opine a little bit. Yes. So the question is, why has a person who has nothing to hide would be so heavily concerned about this level of anonymity and security for my files? I mean, I can think, think of maybe my tax returns, but sure. what, what are people storing, particularly ones that have... I think uh, you're giving away eight gigs for free. Mm -hmm. What am I storing? That's eight gigs that I need to be so. Uh, Whatever you want. Secure. Whatever you want, really. Financial could it, data. I mean, there's. Yeah. Could it be my personal medical records? Could it be my terrorist plans? It could be if you had terrorist plans. Um, 
hopefully you do not, Dan, of course. But um, yeah, so we would, I mean, we don't have any way to prevent that, right? Because right. we don't have any access to what the data is or what it, what it even what the file names are, it's uh, obscured from us. Right, to you it is just one big fat binary blob and you have no idea what it is. Right. When, when you say you do go to your server and you pull up the list of accounts, is it just like maybe indexes of integers with the big, with a big, you know, chunk of yeah. four gigs that represents, you know, file system number two four three. Is that uh, similar? Except it's uh, like random integers or random bytes instead of just like one two three. But yeah. Okay. So that's all well and good, but say I I took a gun to a school system, shot it up, and I threw all my plans in the Arkham yep. dot io. And the federal government said, Max, Amy, help us. We no, no, they don't. They don't request help yeah. us. They come with you a subpoena and they sure. order you to help us. They say, Max, Amy, I want to get into this server. Here is a subpoena that allows me to do it. And oh, by the way, here's a clause saying you're not allowed to tell anybody that I'm yeah. doing that. What yeah. do you do? Well, they also start with assumption that you're actually assisting the terrorists. Sure. Right. Yep. We'll start with phase one right now. That was a <laughs> question that was a note from the audience saying that if you don't do this you're assisting terrorists. Right. right. So this scenario yeah. just landed in your lap, what do you do? Well in this case we would be in a very similar situation to what Apple just went through with the FBI or is still going through with the FBI, right? Um, so Apple refused and or and or could not give the FBI what they wanted um, and so the and we're in a very similar situation we would not be able to um, provide them with what they asked for unless we I don't know we would have to do it some additional work um, and even then I don't even know if it was possible I disagree yeah here's my other idea <laughs> one that you're not gonna like oh no <laughs> to me um, physical access to a server is essentially root access to a server. Mm -hmm. So you have root access shell into that server mm -hmm. to do what you want mm -hmm. and you could potentially push out an update to your clients that has a back door in there without them even knowing it and gradually over time that update will get shoved out and that back door would be available for you to get whatever information that they're wanting. They, they could compel you to do that. And something like this has happened in the past. Sure. Uh, there was an email service called LavaBit mm -hmm. where the government compelled the founders of LavaBit saying, install this into your server so we can get access to these emails. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing that, LavaBit shut, shut down. You're probably familiar with that yep. story. Now, would you be willing to shut down Arkham and walk away from your company that you built up if it came to that? I don't know. We would have to make the decision <laughs> yeah. at the time. It would be highly circumstantial, I think. <laughs> right. Highly circumstantial. But we have no plans for making any back doors, that's for sure. Yep. We ask the hard questions here. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. I mean, kind of not having a back door is kind of the point, right? Right, your your whole premise. the whole yeah. premise of your company is that you have no idea what right. the data is. I mean, we believe that you have the right to the thoughts in your head, and if you have the right to the thoughts in your head, you should be able to digitize them and keep them securely, just as if they were in your head. Would you be able to sleep soundly at night knowing that uh, your service may have helped in? helped a terrorist keep his plan secure from the government? I think there's a lot of internet-based services that could lose, lose sleep at night over that. So if it wasn't Arkham, it'd be another service? I, I think so, yeah. Okay. We hit my must-haves. Okay. Are there any questions from... Yes. 
Oh, as far as the, you may have to repeat this for your uh, That's podcast. fine. Mm -hmm. uh, the decryption algorithms, I've had issues with export control, traveling to yes. certain places with things that I like to carry with me. Okay. The question was, how do you handle export controls? Because a lot of countries do simply do not allow some level of encryption to cross their borders. That's correct. And especially because um, U.S. proprietary encryption algorithms are export controlled, right? Um, it is a controlled substance. Uh, and so we're actually talking with a, an ITAR lawyer right now to work out the very fine details with that. Um, and so what, what's probably going to happen is that we will have to disallow use of the technology in certain countries um, that are not within the, um, I don't know, that are not friends with the United States. Um, but By blocking IP addresses, mostly would be the way to yeah, do that. Yeah, and there's some other things that we could do to block access from certain countries. Um, but in the instance that uh, that you just brought up, like for say, say you want to travel to another country and take your laptop with you and Arkham is, is on it, uh, that's a great scenario that we don't really have the answer to right now. Uh, that's kind of where we're, why we're talking to the... We um, have lawyers for that. Yeah, <laughs> making sure that all of our bases are covered um, before we launch, just to make sure. I would like to jump on that scenario you sure. just said. I take my lap to a, another country and it got stolen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't get into my Arkham account. Is there any way Arkham can help me? Do you have any kind of recovery mechanism for me if my laptop gets stolen? So we're not there yet, but what I would like to, to be able to do is if you had an, an, another laptop or um, eventually a phone or tablet, that you would be able to, um, to disallow access from your files for your other device. Um, for the lost device. For the lost device, and we don't have that yet, um, but that's kind of what we're what we're thinking about. Um, but even if your uh, even if your laptop was stolen, um, they wouldn't necessarily get access to your cloud information. They would still need to input your password um, and so forth. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your data is compromised. If if I lose my laptop and I forget my password, all hope is lost, right? We're working through that scenario right now, actually. Um, and we've got a few plans on how to mitigate that, especially uh, like if I just created my account or if I only have one laptop um, and I drop it in a lake or hard drive fries or, or so forth, we still want to allow the users to um, have access to their data. And so that's kind of what we're we're working through there, and we have some ideas on how to how to solve that problem. Anybody else have a question? Did did How's that it? answer your question? It did. I have other questions. I just don't have anybody else. I don't want to be the only guy here asking questions. No, yeah. We can. You're talk. allowed to ask questions. That's, right. that's why it's live. Mm -hmm. So you've got four people. Yeah, four um, founders. Okay. Uh, funding. What what kind of funding? If you can talk about it. We have been bootstrapping. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so I quit my job back in February, and I'm doing this currently full time on my savings um, right now until we have um, some funding or income. Okay. Yep. And my husband and I are in similar boat. Right. So Jarvis, um, the other co-founder, is the only one that has a, a another full time job right now. So we're trying to get this off off the ground as soon as possible, so we don't continue to eat into savings. So we uh, took the plunge, so to speak. I would like yep. to piggyback off his question and how did you come up with your pricing scheme? Yeah, so uh, we looked at what the um, so how much it would cost to store the information, um, and then kind of looked at what the what the other competitors were doing. And admittedly, Dropbox and Google have a um, lower price per gigabyte than we do. Um, but we want something to be, uh, I don't know, still within the realm of um, customers' avail availability to, to purchase it, right, without being uh, too expensive. So there is some margin based on our, our cloud storage uh, and the data that we use, but they're... Um, 
that's pretty much it. We ba really base it off of our costs, um, how much it costs us to store, to store the data. Right, and based on your pricing structure, you, had, you anticipate at least four gigs of it you can hand out to the masses. Mm -hmm. So that tells me you're giving away a bunch of free accounts and hoping a handful of power users yeah. will pay and subsidize. The right, users. and we've, we've done the calculations on, um, for instance, if one person buys um, tier one, then how many free users does that cover? And we've got that calculation done for all four of the other, other tiers. And that's assuming that your tier one user consumes all 64 gigabytes, sure. you would still be able to cover the others? Yep. Okay. Yep. Now, what, in my own uh, development of network-based systems mm -hmm. and servers and such, what I've found, the bottleneck is very rarely space. It's all the connections coming in. Mm -hmm. If you don't write a, an efficient TCP server, it spikes your processor and that's where you have problems. Sure. So, are all these four gigabyte installations hanging around everywhere pinging your server going to cause that to break before disk space ever becomes an issue? Yeah. We hope not. We haven't reached that um, hurdle yet, but I don't think so. Uh, so the way that we've architected the system is it so that we can scale um, if we need to based on CPU or memory usage or so forth. We talked a lot about the client. Is yeah. there any details you can give us about the server? Uh, we can, I can say a few things. Um, we're using um, Docker. Of course, everybody's using Docker these days, just about. Um, but we're also using um, Kubernetes uh, on top of that, which allows us to um, scale and so forth with our cluster. And um, just by like one a single command, I can increase the number of uh, servers that we're using and so forth based on the usage. Um, so are these actual physical servers? Located somewhere? Uh, they're okay. located in the in data center, yes. So these are slices of cloud mm -hmm. services backed by, I probably, you probably don't want to tell us, that uh, you provision off and that you can sure. grow yeah. and collapse as needed. Right. Okay. That's a, I like that system. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So one thing uh, we haven't really talked about is the, um, is the other business models. So we've talked a lot about the, the strictly consumer-based business model. Um, so that is our, I guess, our entry point into the market. But we do have uh, two other uh, markets that we do want to kind of address. And namely, and Amy, I don't know if you, you want to take this. Right. So there's, there's B2C, which is business to consumer, and then there's B2B, which is business to business. So um, we're looking at the B2B market specifically through um, Max has written an API for the platform and there's a lot of companies that maybe have their own data that they want to secure without having to do all the work that, that we've done to build the platform. So the API, they could um, purchase a subscription to the API much like they would to our service and use it for their own applications. I was thinking about this for myself. Like Maybe it would be good to have my Git repo sitting in Arkham somewhere mm -hmm. versus, you know, a GitLab or a GitHub, or even if you right. flag it private, I mean, I'm sure a GitHub engineer could still get in there and take mm -hmm. a look at it if you wanted. And, you know, I'm, this is the source code to, you know, Microsoft Word. You know, I don't want that getting out. Right. So this mm -hmm. isn't the kind of the business to business storage you're looking at? Yeah, so there's actually, well, go ahead, Amy. I'm right. Sorry. <laughs> so um, my husband and I are currently living in Seattle, and Seattle um, digital healthcare is like a really big thing there right now. So there's a lot of um, healthcare companies that have health, personal health records. So we're looking at um, companies like that that may want to secure their data. But um, there's also um, there's a variety of industries that, that could use the API. Yeah, so um, on top of that, we also want to offer another market which would be allowing, let's say, law offices. If a law office would want to, um, to buy a subscription, the business itself, and allow usage of the desktop client for all of their lawyers and secretaries and all of their employees, 
um, to store legal documents, then that's another um, market that we're trying to pursue. If, mm -hmm. if a law office would not necessarily want to write a, a new client for their, um, for their use, maybe they want to use our desktop application to store all of their legal documents. I would theorize that the law office, you know, with the law clerk, wouldn't even want to use the desktop application either. They would rather have some kind of Dropbox, Google Drive method where all they have to do is save it to a folder and mm -hmm. poop the magic happens. Right. Yeah. So I was wondering if you would, if your client is, you have something in the works to where you would, you know, be pulling a file folder to just have it done. That is one of the features that um, that we're going to include is again through the desktop application being able to add folders um, that, that could be monitored for changes and automatically syn synchronized if someone put it on there or even download it uh, if again from another laptop you uploaded it um, just automatically download it um, right and your client you could be adapted to where you mul you can monitor multiple drives versus having just mm -hmm. one single Google Drive or one single Dropbox right. you can say look for legal documents security videos, you know, mm -hmm. all the paths they want set up. Maybe even have it resting on a, uh, you know, the their stored server. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can be a, a, a backup service similar to Carbonite. Right. That is more secure than Carbonite. I'm sure Carbonite is secure, but somehow they're able to send you a disk drive of all your files if you lose it. So. Yeah. Somebody yeah. can get, somebody can get into it somehow. Right. Yeah. Versus binary blobs, which are you. Right. Yeah. So I guess to I guess to summarize that we're really going after three main market segments: the consumers, uh, again in, individuals, and then again the the law office that would buy it by a subscription to allow all of their employees to use it, and then the third one would be like Amy was mentioning the API where. Um, we would like to offer a, a service where if you wanted to build a, like a GitHub, uh, or not GitHub, like a Git uh, repository backup that is encrypted, then you would be able to buy a subscription to build your own client or command line application. Uh, to Can use I build it. my own server? I guess you could, yeah. Yeah, so it could be uh, as long as you have access to the API and a subscription to it, um, we want to give you access to it as long as you're paying, of course. But yeah, that's kind of where we're going. Um, I think the the third strategy really broadens um, where uh, the technology can be used. Um, like you mentioned, uh, like Git repos. Amy mentioned healthcare records, mm -hmm. um, uh, financial or legal documents. There's many, many industries that can make Terrorist use of Terrorist plans. Terrorist plans, yes. <laughs> We've been yes. followed by <laughs> plastic surgeons on Twitter because I'm sure they have before and after photos that they would like to keep private. Right. So it's really sort of the applications are endless. Yeah. Any other questions? So you mentioned a couple different kind of uh, target audiences, mm -hmm. um, but with kind of the, the launch looming, who are maybe the first like 100 users that you're trying to target to really be the first group that gets in there and gets to play with it? The, the question are, is who's going to be the first 100 users that you see signing up? Probably tech enthusiasts yeah. who just want to play with it. And then hopefully they'll tell their friends. So the way that we've really been advertising, especially on Twitter, um, is towards the security-minded and tech-minded individuals. Um, because we, we think that that crowd uh, is really interested in, the, in using the increased privacy and security uh, features and really the value that we add, um, more so than maybe even the average consumer. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Where does my data go if I quit paying? That is a good question. Yeah, yeah. so they haven't probably had that problem yet. <laughs> no, no, it has not. Later, yeah. You're gonna yeah. have a problem with well, how long you keep? I mean, that's where yeah. your lawyers come in. The, the, is, the yeah. question was: Is what happens to my data if I stop paying? Mm -hmm. So, wh what we're kind of thinking, and again, like you mentioned, the lawyers. Uh, what we're guiding the lawyers to do is to set up something where if you are 
maybe miss a payment or are late on a payment, we don't want all of your data to be deleted just because um, maybe financial hardship for the short term, right? So we would like to keep your data up till 60 or 90 days and then delete it um, so that if you are able to um, subscribe again or, or whatever, then you would still have access to it. So this is Especially if you have several um, tens or hundreds of, gig of gigabytes stored, we don't want you to lose that um, just because um, your subscription was late or so forth. The way, I think the way one service does it is your data becomes read-only for a period of time. Right. So you may do that. Yeah. Pause the account. The client can only fetch right. till X number of time. Then you mm -hmm. blast their account. Yeah, if you stop paying, you would probably want to download all your stuff keep it somewhere else. <laughs> All right. Is there any way to guarantee where the location where of the server where the data resides? Not right now. Um, again, most of our advertising is on Twitter, and we have had some um, European individuals contact us or send us messages about wanting um, data centers in Europe. So that is something that's cons that we're considering, but that would be more mid to long term right now. So I can't put things on data centers outside the U.S. Mm, right. So we've already, I mean, there's a couple of different major cloud services we've already discounted because I can't, I can't even mm. use them. Mm. So that might be another, I don't know if you run into the same thing on the medical side, but um, yeah. defense stuff, yeah, you run into issues with that. Depending on the size, I know that large cloud providers like Amazon let you choose which server to mm. land on. And since you've hinted that you're using a large cloud provider as a backing for you, you may have access to that, but mm -hmm. I doubt you would pull that information, make it available to the end user. Right. But I don't know, that might be something to think yeah, about. Yeah, especially if it's a, once we get Especially going, if their data not allowed to reside in some other place, right. even if it is just binary blobs. Right. Yeah, so right now we don't have that capability, or we have we're not thinking about offering that capability, right. but if there is enough of a, um, I don't know, want or need for that, then that's something that we could add, yeah. Okay. Very good. Let's have a round of applause for... <laughs>